Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mike Lilly. The class is Intro to Criminal Justice. This is our 21st lecture this semester, occurring on October 8th, 2018. And growing shorter. Essentially, we have, what, two months left this semester. So, actually, less than two months since Thanksgiving is a week off. So, um, things change somewhat. Last uh, lecture, <clears throat> we were talking about uh, management of law enforcement. And again, uh, I don't hit upon uh, some of that too much. Uh, simply because once you get for UCJ majors, there is uh, an entire semester in police organization and administration, which is an upper level class, but particularly goes into the many, many management and administrative issues that police departments uh, face. And again, <clears throat> Policing has uh, certainly changed since the old years. Basically, everything was done uh, by field officers. And <clears throat> the only purpose of the administration was to try to put some, some things in writing down. <coughs> things have certainly become much more common. Uh, so what I want to talk about today, however, is uh, the one thing that probably has done more to change policing and how policing operates uh, in the United States than the World Trade Center collapse on 9-11. And that's because suddenly law enforcement uh, in this country had to shift to a brand new major mission objective. And that mission objective was not fighting crime, was not trying to deter crime or other things involved the fact that law enforcement found itself having to deal with preventing terrorism or responding to terrorist attacks. Uh, let's be honest, as sophisticated as New York City thought they were, after the collapse of the two buildings, uh, what happened? Well, pardon me, here's my eyes watering again. Uh, well, what happened was that uh, literally thousands of volunteer first responders, etc., flocked to the site, went through it, many with little of any uh, protected gear on their face or around them, trying to go through the rubble to see if they could find the remains over 3,000 people that died when those two buildings went down. And as I speak, we are seeing continual health problems. For the vast majority of those persons who responded to the Twin Tower collapse uh, as a result of having inhaled uh, lots of toxic uh, chemicals and other issues, uh, toxic gases. Uh, <clears throat> to be honest, uh, I guess no city is probably truly uh, ever going to be ready to s for such a mass calamity. But uh, New York City certainly uh, suffered its share. And of course, uh, I'm talking about health programs. I'm not talking about uh, the hundreds of police and firemen who died when the buildings collapsed. Again, I'm talking about those uh, who went to the scene, uh, ground zero, 
after the buildings collapsed. But a number of things began happening uh, after 9-11, and that is that the whole country seems to pivot from law enforcement in many ways to anti-terrorism. And the two are completely different functions as for most police departments. Now I've already commented in this class about New York City and its rather large anti-terrorism unit, which actually has uh, branch offices in a number of cities overseas, uh, London, Paris, Berlin. Uh, but uh, many other large U.S. cities have also found themselves having to adapt to the issue of prospective terrorist attacks, etc. For quite a while, in fact, after the 9-11 incident, uh, there were lots of people in this country very much afraid that there would be repeats of those attacks, that we would see more planes crashing into more public buildings, that we would uh, that all sorts of things could take place which would uh, again have an impact or an influence upon uh, public safety. The reality, of course, is that we've been pretty lucky due to enhanced uh, federal uh, law enforcement efforts with the FBI, NSA, and others, we've not had any such major attacks since then. Uh, for one reason, I guess, uh, we've never had uh, Al Qaeda, of course, uh, and Bin Laden. We're very much uh, decommissioned for quite some time as a result of the American invasion into Afghanistan and the routing uh, of the Taliban government, uh, which sent uh, bin, both bin Laden and Omar, Mullah, well, Mullah Omar, into exile in Pakistan. They didn't all ever had these large training camps where they could train large numbers of people. And so they lost some, a lot of their operational abilities. Indeed, Al-Qaeda then changes from a centrally commanded organization to a group of rather a regional, loosely tied affiliates of Al-Qaeda. Uh, and to be honest, uh, although we've had a number of terrorist attempts at attacking the U.S., almost all of them have been originated uh, either in the Middle East or in Europe, few, uh, except mainly for some lone wolf type operations, have actually occurred in this country. Uh, certainly, we've not ever seen any more mass training of large numbers of people who wanted to fly airplanes and then care about where they, uh, you know, what about them landing. Uh, and so the end result is that uh, here in the United States, uh, we've been pretty lucky. Yeah, there have been some uh, rather what I call bizarre attempts at blowing up airplanes coming into the country. I always like to think of that so-called underwear bomber who boarded the plane with explosives uh, sewn into his underwear, his uh, uh, boxer shorts, I guess, uh, in an attempt uh, with it, the view being he would go into the bathroom and ignite those. Um, unfortunately, uh, 
the equipment for him, that is, the equipment malfunctioned. He, he didn't blow up, but he suffered third degree burns in some rather painful places. Um, and his underwear caught fire and burned him. Uh, then we had uh, the, another individual who boarded a plane with explosive hidden in the heels of his shoes. The view being he would take the heel of his shoe off again, there would be explosive components. He'd blow the plane up. That didn't work either. Uh, probably the closest to success was uh, a Yemeni attempt to uh, load uh, toner cartridges in uh, printers which were being shipped to the U.S. and those cartridges were full of explosives. Uh, all of that fortunately was uh, intercepted by the U.S. Uh, before they could really board any planes. And the interesting thing of course uh, about uh, this and also some computers that had explosives built into them is that for some reason they were all going to blow up um, aircraft flying into Detroit of all U.S. cities. And I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure what the Detroit connection was or why it was such a target, but uh, that's what supposedly they were aimed at. Of course, we have had other homegrown terrorist attacks uh, talked about and I mentioned from time to time. But basically speaking, all of a sudden we began to realize just how susceptible the United States is to some kind of terrorist attack on any kind of major uh, scale. You know, at a time in which a squirrel in Ohio uh, while climbing on electrical lines, misjudged jump, uh, causing uh, electrocuting itself and causing a, a transformer at a power station in central Ohio to uh, blow the transformer. The transformer then causes reverberations, just like uh, you know a domino chain does and knocked out power for electricity, electrical power, for almost the entire East Coast, going from Canada and clean parts of Canada uh, all the way into uh, North Carolina. Uh, what kind of terrorist attack would it take, therefore, to repeat that, except on a planned basis? And the answer is that even after lots of effort and money being spent, it still would be relatively easy in the coordinated attack to knock out the two major power grids here in the United States on both the East and the West Coast and plunge in our country into darkness and possible uh, inability uh, to defend uh, to any kind of coordinated other attack. Uh, The end result, therefore, is that all of a sudden, law enforcement had to start worrying about things like the electrical grid, things like uh, internet, etc. In particular, they had to start worrying about lax, in some cases, almost non-existent security around the nation's nuclear power plants all of which could easily be attacked at that time uh, without much, you know, and, and cause major damage, major issues. So, as your text points out in chapter six, therefore, uh, we certainly have uh, major uh, efforts being used by many police departments again to create viable anti-terrorist campaigns 
in those cities viewed to be most susceptible to terrorist activities. And by the way, one of the reasons why New York City is so involved is because 23 US, uh, NYPD police officers died in the Twin Towers collapse. Okay. Um, after that, uh, again, uh, along with a number of studies as talked about in your text, uh, uh, there is created again a so called joint uh, terrorism task force, which is supposed to put together federal and local law enforcement again in an effort to view uh, issues about terrorism. Uh, despite that fact, however, <clears throat> and also the rise of what your text talks about as intelligence led policing. Uh, we still find most cities and communities, in a lot of ways, uh, really uh, unprepared to deal with major terrorist attacks. Let's mention three major domestic terrorist attacks, uh, all of whom appear to be somewhat lone wolf operations. Uh, <clears throat> One in San Bernardino, California, where a Middle Eastern couple who were here in the United States lawfully uh, go on a killing rampage, uh, killing uh, 14 co workers of the husband. The husband and wife then later dying in a blazing shootout with law enforcement who attempted to stop them from their next target. In Nash, outside of Nashville, Tennessee, a converted and disgruntled uh, mem former member of the military drives his car down the highway, shooting up uh, armed forces recruitment agencies. In Florida, Again, we have a uh, internet ISIS convert <coughs> who attacks a gay nightclub <coughs> at the so-called Pulse nightclub, killing almost 50 people. <coughs> uh, <coughs> once again, a terrorist. New York City itself has had several terrorist attacks and planned. The most deadly, again, a, a truck driver who rents a rather large truck <coughs> and then drives it down the pedestrian parkway, killing a number of people and injuring many others before he stopped and shot to death. <coughs> and of course, the military itself the so-called Fort Hood massacre occurring when a Muslim a major in the U.S. Army uh, suddenly goes on a murder spree killing unarmed Army recruits as they are training there at Fort Hood. All of these are pretty much have one thing in common and that is that they're inspired <clears throat> primarily by propaganda spots coming over the internet uh, regarding, again, uh, the uh, what we in this country call uh, ISIS, now more commonly referred to in your press as IS, for the Islamic State or Daesh, which is what the Arabs call it. Uh, many of these spots uh, originating out originally out of uh, southern Lep southern Yemen, but then later moving uh, into the uh, supposed capital city of the uh, self-proclaimed ISIS Caliphate in the city of Raqqa, Syria. 
for whatever reason, it was discovered by the leaders of this terrorist organization that with a little bit of sophistication, they could put up videos on the internet uh, falsely talking about how great their uh, beliefs and views were uh, promoting uh, their territorial property in Iraq and Syria, uh, as you will, with, as a would-be utopia, right, where everyone will live, uh, you know, uh, okay. And <clears throat> there have been a number of, uh, you know, thousands of foreign fighters would uh, flock to the Middle East for ISIS purposes. Uh, at one time, it's believed probably ISIS had uh, 30 to 40,000 troops uh, in their command, most of whom were foreigners to Syria and Iraq, including a number of Americans, uh, certainly Europeans. Uh, even today, in areas of this country where we have a number of refugees from the ISIS uh, problem in Syria and Iraq, and particularly in Syria, in and around Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where there's a very large uh, Somali, Somalian uh, refugee center, we see uh, young kids, uh, 15, 16, 17, being converted uh, by watching these videos and then deciding either to go fight in Afghanistan or Syria or uh, homeland, you know, terrorist actions here at home. I'm not really sure that there's any one great answer to dealing with these websites. And to be honest, uh, I don't even know how to get to them since they're all part of the so-called dark web these days, which is a, a branch of internet service that is not really policed uh, in any way because it operates on different servers than it does the rest of the internet process. Um, it's all part of the internet, but these particular sites are uh, if you will, off the grid for want of a better term. And again, there still are recruiting videos today, which could be downloaded. Again, extolling the virtue again uh, of uh, these uh, Salafi jihadist movements and talking about again how great, uh, how great it is to live. Uh, I'm, I'm constantly really interested uh, into the number of young American teenage girls who left this country, going to Syria, believing again that they would be treated properly, only to find themselves uh, as uh, sex slaves there in Syria and other parts of the world. At any rate, what I'm trying to get at is that there have been a number of attempts here in the United States to combat uh, this so-called cyber uh, internet propaganda. Uh, many of these websites, as soon as they are discovered, can be shut down by our cyber security people. But that doesn't mean that they can't, don't pop up and start running again. After all, here I am lecturing on the internet. What does it take me to set up this video lecture? Uh, about two minutes. So what does it take anyone in the world who's got Wi-Fi capability and a laptop? <coughs> Not very long to post propaganda videos or whatever. And of course, uh, a lot of this uh, uh, ISIS propaganda is uh, quite gruesome. 
I, for example, for instance, would show uh, scenes of uh, their enemies being beheaded in front of you. Uh, one of the most infamous is the poor Jordanian Air Force pilot who's put in a cage and burned alive, or gasoline and flamethrowers. Uh, and all of this on the internet, again, looping around. Uh, fortunately, I guess for most of us, it is the so-called lone wolf attacks, that is, people who have not been in some kind of training camp in Syria or Iraq or some other place, but mainly uh, get converted to their cause uh, over the internet. We've been kind of lucky. I don't really know, at least at this point in time, of whether or not we're going to really see uh, large numbers, again, of uh, Americans still being drawn to the cause. But it still means that police and law enforcement, particularly in areas where there's a lot of vulnerability around for a terrorist attack, have to be constantly on guard and try to look for that. And even though, as your text points out, there's a lot of sharing of, of information between law enforcement, both state and local, I mean federal, state, and local, uh, even though we had created the so-called fusion centers you mentioned here in your text, uh, all of which, again, are basically state-level organizations aimed at uh, intervening and getting involved in uh, particularly emergency situations. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, currently uh, every state in this country now has a fusion center operating. Uh, most, many states have two or more. West Virginia is uh, kind of unique and only has really one. It's up in the state capitol building. Uh, I've been there a time or two, so I'll tell you, there it is. Um, at any rate, uh, fusion centers, as talked about in your text, uh, have a lot of purposes. And certainly anti-terrorism is one of those major purposes. Okay, how effective would that be as far as uh, here in this country? Uh, I think they've been pretty effective so far. Uh, it's probably, I guess, impossible to get some of these lone wolf attackers or all of them uh, off the grid or whatever, but uh, it's nice to think about. Uh, the last thing is talked about in Chapter 6. And, uh, <clears throat> a whole lot less than used to be talked about, and that is uh, ethnic and gender diversity in policing. And so I'll simply make a comment that in the past here in the United States, the one greatest failure we always had was that law enforcement seemed to be a white male profession uh, not aimed at anyone else, even though the first female police officer was all the way back in the early 1900s. It is interesting today how many large national police, large municipal police departments are run by women, um, including uh, Birmingham, Alabama, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and many other large U.S. cities. Uh, I think that uh, women in law enforcement have been very, very effective and uh, have been accepted a lot more than in the old days uh, when a certain landmark TV series called uh, Cagney and Lacey portray two female uh, New York City police officers and, and their frequent problems. 
most of those problems might not happen today. There are still, uh, however, uh, in law enforcement, uh, major issues and major concerns regarding uh, the lack of women and also the lack of other minorities in policing. And one of the things everybody I know I've always talked about as far as uh, these issues are concerned is uh, simply the fact that uh, it's becoming increasingly more and more difficult to attract women to law enforcement because of the problems perceived of that they will have while on the job. Uh, I guess we'll, that remains to be seen. Okay, uh, there are two chapters I'm not going to cover at all regarding uh, the area of policing. One is chapter seven, which is all basically a criminal procedure and guess what criminal procedure is a whole semester which I start taking up here sooner than I may think. And so for that reason, I really don't get into it. The other is chapter nine, uh, which once again is criminal procedure also. And uh, so I don't get into chapter nine. Uh, basically, therefore, we have one more chapter left in this area of law enforcement. And that's chapter eight. And as soon as I get through with chapter eight, uh, most likely Monday of maybe next week, we'll have another test in this class on these policing chapters. Uh, again, I'll review for them probably on Friday uh, after I get through uh, talking about uh, chapter eight, which basically is a discussion of a lot of major issues that come about uh, in policing uh, today, every day, uh, and are certainly talked a lot about uh, in uh, today's media. Now, As a result of that, therefore, we're going to take up uh, chapter eight on Wednesday. We'll start getting into that situation and uh, go from there next couple of classes. I'm going to close for now because I know that lots of students listening to me here in Bluefield have got a little, a very easy test they have to take here in a few minutes. And so I'll let them, uh, a last few minutes of study. Uh, unless there's questions in the class, I'm going to go ahead and log out here today. Again, uh, we'll go from